Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today we're going to float different ways to transport yourself and your stuff in the case of a lights out situation. We're going to talk about the most practical to the most obscure modes of commuting post grid down event. So let's get to it. So there's many considerations for grid down transportation. Among these are things like fuel, practicality, accessibility, cost, ease of maintenance, durability, loudness, and also the capability in terms of towing capacity, payload, and off-road abilities, as well as the weather and the climate that you're in are obviously going to be factors that you're going to have to consider when trying to make a plan for grid down commuting. Now in 99% of short term emergency scenarios, your current vehicle or mode of transport is going to suffice. Unless of course you rely on public transportation, then you're gonna to wanna to consider one of the options we talk about today. But for most people in anything less than a Mad Max scenario, your own vehicle will suffice. Making sure that your gas tank is always somewhere between half and full, especially in the winter time, is one of the best ways to be proactive from an emergency preparedness standpoint. The last position you want to put yourself in is one of the frantic melee that's going to take place at the many gas stations where you're going to be waiting hours on end and the gas may even run out before you get there. Try to have the legally allowable amount of fuel stored on hand, taking into account, of course, the shelf life of the various fuels that you may have to use in your vehicle. Gasoline, of course, has a relatively short lifespan of six months unless you use fuel stabilizers. These are going to prevent degradation and maintain the combustibility of the gasoline. If used properly, these can extend the life of your gasoline for up to two years. But it should be noted that the older your gasoline is, the harder it is gonna be on your engine. So you wanna rotate this stuff out frequently. Gasoline with a high ethanol content has a much shorter lifespan of approximately three months. Many in the preparedness community prefer to use diesel over gasoline for a variety of reasons. Firstly, it has a slightly longer shelf life than gasoline of up to a year without the use of fuel stabilizers. Diesel engines, at least the older ones, could be modified to use fuels like vegetable oil. Unfortunately, the newer diesel engines, due to electrical regulation and more computers being used to regulate the engine, they're going to be more sensitive to these more obscure fuel types than older diesel engines would be. So it's recommended that if you are looking to build a Mad Max style vehicle that can run on anything, then you're probably going to want to get something pre-2005. Diesel just may be in greater abundance after a collapse scenario because the most sought out form of fuel is going to be gasoline and that is going to run out very quick. Most people don't have diesel engines unless you're talking about semis and heavy equipment and a lot of those vehicles and machinery are not going to be utilized after a grid down event. So there will be fuel to scavenge not only from them, but there probably will be an abundance of fuel, much more than gasoline. Now with regards to preparing for an electromagnetic pulse, because the likelihood of a scenario like that is so small, and because only 5-10% to 10 of vehicles are going to be permanently disabled as a result of it, it's my personal choice not to base my entire grid down vehicle strategy on that one possible event. If that is something that is of concern to you, then you're definitely going to favor the more traditional and analog modes of commuting that we're going to talk about today. Now the one mode of transport that everybody should have in their arsenal because it's so cheap to do so is a bike. It requires no fuel, it's quiet, they're small, they're agile, they're relatively cheap of course, you can obviously spend a lot of money on bikes nowadays, but generally speaking you can find a used bike on Craigslist for 10 to $20. They're practical, you're going to use it every day, especially if you want to exercise, if you want to run the dog. It's a simple design so you don't have to be a mechanic to understand how to fix them. The only limiting factor of course is going to be the tires. A good pair of mountain bike tires with thicker tread can last you up to 3,000 miles. That's a lot of pedaling when you think about it. However, if you are using it with great frequency in a prolonged grid down situation, you're definitely gonna to wanna to have extra tires or at the very least extra tubes on hand in various parts that would help you fix things like the drivetrain. Now the cons of a bike are pretty obvious. They're relatively slow, of course, compared to a car. You can only carry so much weight on them. Mind you, if you have a trailer, you can pull a lot more, but it's still going to require a lot of calories, so it's going to require a lot of energy, human power, of course, and ultimately you may in fact run out of parts. But there's no reason not to have a bike. Now the next evolution is an e-bike, and e-bikes are arguably the best form of post-collapse 
vehicle that you can get. They're potentially much quieter than normal bikes. There's an obvious advantage, of course, in that they require less energy than an electric vehicle, even though, of course, you do have a smaller payload and you can't tow as much. You can, of course, recharge them, so they're renewable, and many of these lithium batteries can be charged 1,000 to 2,000 times in some cases. Most of the batteries are of small enough capacity that they can be charged within a reasonable time frame, so a 40 amp hour battery, which is pretty large in terms of e-bikes, will charge with relative ease under a couple hundred watt solar panels throughout the course of a day. Hunting e-bikes like this one here called the Mule may be ideal for preparedness because they're built very rugged. They're built to take a lot of abuse. These environments, of course, better replicate what you might find in a grid down situation. The good thing about an e-bike is that even if the electrical components fail, you can still use it as a bike for most of the bikes that you can find on the market. You can spend up to $10,000 on the toppest notch e-bike there is out there. And especially if you wanna add extra batteries, uh, you can extend your range of course by just backpacking a few batteries. You can get several hundred miles of range out of an e-bike if you do it right. But of course there is gonna be a limited lifespan of those batteries, you can only charge them so many times. But realistically a thousand charge cycles unless you're using that bike to its limit every day is going to last you at least a decade. Now, electric vehicles, the pros of those, of course, is that they are very low maintenance. There's less moving parts. They are very high performance machines. They're incredibly quiet, and that could be a huge obsec factor, especially at night when sounds can be heard from long distances. It's difficult to hear when an electric vehicle is on when you're right next to it but you can hear most combustion engines from miles away, especially at night. The cons as of 2019 is that they're still very expensive and considered luxury vehicles, at least the electric vehicles that a person would want, like the Teslas. And they also consume very large amounts of electricity that would require a very large solar installation. And it would require you to have a lot of surplus power that you weren't using to power all the other essential things on your off-grid homestead. But one thing that you need to keep in mind is that you don't necessarily need to charge the vehicle to full every day. Even if you were only trickle charging it with several kilowatt hours of power every day, you could probably get as much energy as you needed depending on how much you were driving. In the case of an economic crisis where you had gas prices skyrocketing, and you had a solar installation, you could foreseeably have a relatively unlimited mode of transportation. Now, a lot of people will talk about electromagnetic pulse and how these vehicles are gonna be much more vulnerable to an event like that. Of course, this would be a very rare event, even though a coronal mass ejection event like the Carrington event is ultimately inevitable, events like that are not going to affect the circuitry of a vehicle. And in the off chance of WW3 scenario, we're gonna have a lot bigger problems, nuclear power plants being one of them, than worry about our EVs not running. Now this next alternative may ultimately be the only alternative on a long enough timeline after a grid down event. And that is the use of animals, horses, mules, donkeys, even camels in some parts of the world have obvious benefits because they basically run on grass. So the fuel is cheap and it's pretty much everywhere, although they are going to need a grazing territory, which is going to require land, which you're going to have to, of course, protect. And of course, to see them through the winter, you're going to have to have many, many bales of hay to provide them energy. This, of course, is going to require a lot of labor to harvest. Harvesting your own food is one thing. Harvesting some for your animals is another. Which is not to say that there's not wild horses who subsist in winter climates and are able to still find vegetation to eat during those times. But wild horses, of course, can go wherever they want and you are going to want to tame that horse. The great thing about horses, of course, is they are basically all-terrain vehicles. Horses being animals are also good early warning signs. They can alert you of danger long before you might notice it. They can carry relatively large loads, they can be bred, they can be sold, and of course, it's the only vehicle that you can eat if it fails you. Now some of the cons of course is that like with any living thing there is potential for health problems. A horse is going to leave a lot more sign and scat so it's going to be harder to cover your tracks and keeping a domesticated horse alive wouldn't be an easy task. It would require a lot of work as previously indicated. 
And the last downside is that they're going to be very costly. And if you don't know anything about horses before the collapse, chances are that lack of knowledge will carry over post-collapse. But if you do know somebody who has horses, keep them in mind as a possible post-collapse ally. Even if they're not a prepper, you can help them and maybe they can help you. Now for some more unconventional methods. There's thousands of miles of train tracks within North America. They are everywhere and they permeate every crevice of the continent. There used to be these things called hand lever rail trolleys that were basically man-powered single train cars. And they would allow you to go between 8 to 15 miles per hour with minimal effort or at least a lot less effort than it would take you to ride a bike because the rails are a more efficient way of moving freight because there's not as much friction. That's why trains are four times more efficient than any other form of moving large amounts of goods from one place to another. The problem, of course, with this is that after a lights out scenario, there's going to be a lot of abandoned trains on train tracks. Even in the old days when there was thousands of these, when they were building the railroads, most of these hand trolleys were meant to transport people between two points which were say 20 miles away and every 20 miles there'd be a different set of hand trolleys but even if it was a good idea you'd have a hard time finding one of these but the idea is there and train tracks in the very least could still potentially be used by your own vehicle if there is congestion and total gridlock after a grid down event. Probably one of the most dangerous forms of post-collapse transport would have to be a hot air balloon. Now hot air balloons were the first mechanisms used in air combat back in the 18th century and their role was primarily for reconnaissance purposes. There was incendiary balloons and I'm sure there was some other capacity that they were used in a combative sense but by and large it was for recon. These balloons, they can achieve fairly impressive speeds as fast as the wind will allow. The fastest ever recorded was 245 miles per hour and could travel for thousands of miles on one tank. Now they were able to use these in the 18th century because the weaponry back then was not sophisticated enough to shoot it down. Today, that would be another story. And the obvious downside of course is that it is going to require fuel to use. The balloons that don't use helium use propane and propane has a very long shelf life. I should add there are some vehicles that do run on propane, although they are very rare, but that would be an ideal vehicle because of the stability of the fuel over a long period of time. Now, another mode of transport would be by boat. I've said before that rivers are nature's roads. Unfortunately, they typically are one way roads. Yes, you can paddle upstream, but it's going to be highly inefficient. But when you can go with the current, that's one of the best ways to travel. It can be very quiet. You can use a sail to harvest the convective energy and you can carry as large of a load as your boat will allow. It was with boats and by rivers that a lot of industrial work was done, especially here in Canada with respect to logging in the pre-industrialized era. The cons, of course, is that you will be a literal sitting duck. It's very hard to conceal yourself when you're on open water. Rivers are one way, and of course, there's the issue of those pesky pirates. Another alternative, which is often floated around, is wood gas. Of course, there probably will be plentiful fuel in wooded areas. Of course, you will have to cut that fuel down. So just because you have a wood gasification vehicle doesn't mean the work is done, not even close. You have to go and harvest all of that wood, which is incredibly time consuming and takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of tools and it can potentially be quite dangerous. The problem with wood gas is number one, they require that you build one. That may be an easy task for people who are mechanically adept, but for most people, good luck. It's going to require lots of wood to use. It's potentially more volatile substance. It produces carbon monoxide and the wood gas is gonna create a tar residue that is gonna eventually clog up and wear down your engine. So it's really only a short term solution unless you plan on taking apart and cleaning all the aspects of your engine every few months. Now, some preppers have converted their cars to run on vegetable oil. I personally don't think that this is the most practical solution simply because of the fact that vegetable oil is potentially calories that you can use to cook. And if we're talking about a prolonged grid down situation where you would require something like vegetable oil, 
to run a vehicle, then chances are calories are going to be in short supply also. I understand the reasoning for having a vehicle like this while the grid is up. While this substance may be disposed of anyways, you might as well recycle it and get some mileage out of it. Now obviously there's going to be a lot of places where you could scavenge this type of stuff like in restaurants, but I think some people over exaggerate the significance of that kind of conversion. It's nice to have a diesel for the possibility of being able to do that. But then again, I think if we're talking about long-term electric vehicles or livestock are the way to go. Now lastly, and this is probably among the most practical, is hand carts, game carts, things like the monowalker like I've reviewed on this channel before, sleds, uh, travois as they're traditionally called, and even shopping carts for urban areas. These are all great man portable ways to transport large amounts of gear and in some cases like in the case of the monowalker you can even do this overland. Obviously they're going to be slow going, they're going to require a lot of energy especially if you're going uphill but it's an option. Now things like dirt bikes and quads uh, they're going to be very noisy of course they're going to run on gasoline. There are now electric variants of both of those things coming to market. So that may be something that you want to look into. I personally can't wait for EV four-wheelers to become a thing or EV bikes. Uh, there are electric motorcycles already, but they haven't really had their day in the sun yet. So let me know in the comment section what's your preferred mode of post grid down transport is going to be. Maybe it's something that I failed to talk about today. Maybe you want to share your thoughts on some of the methods that I discussed in this video. I made a couple other videos that are similar to this. So I'm going to post it in the end cards here. One is on electric vehicles and one is on 4x4s and trucks weighing the pros and cons of SUVs versus trucks and why I personally went with a truck. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this YouTube channel Channel is to support yourself by gearing up through CanadianPreparedness.com or BugOutRoll.ca. Premium quality gear at the best possible price using the incredibly secure and easy to use Shopify platform. We offer free shipping to the United States for orders over $200 USD and free shipping to Canada over $75. So support the channel by supporting yourself.